Hallelujah. We are live, guys. God bless. We're going to open up in prayer. We're going to worship, speak in tongues, raise up our voices. Uh, Brother Lawifi, open us up in prayer. So many things to pray for. Um, if you have your Bibles, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Uh, what don't you want? So let's open up and believe God to help us here in our church. Believe in God for... Uh, a building, believing God to move for revival, believing God to help us uh, and increase in every arena of our lives. You pray for your family, yourself, your mind, your body, your emotions, so we can be conquerors and overcomers. As how many of you know Jesus needs a healthy church, not a perfect church, and by healthy that means everything that we are. We are emotional beings, um, we are mental beings, you know, the way that we are in our thinking projection of ourselves in the future so you pray for yourself and be encouraged let's pray for uh, the body one another all the people in the homes we're going to be gathering i believe that we're going to move out of the 1a 1b uh, phase and hopefully move further as they start to bring the kids back and possibly you know say hey you know what with the vaccine as it's going out um, so you be encouraged with that let's also believe god for our leaders fellowship leaders, um, my pastor Paul Stevens, uh, Pastor Foley, uh, Greg Mitchell, Prescott, um, as they oversee the fellowship and the direction and we maintain our biblical principles of discipleship, evangelism, uh, planting churches uh, worldwide. Let's also pray for our elected leaders. Let's pray for God's hand of grace upon them as they uh, wrestle through the, uh, the civil government of our of our uh, established system and they work through the process and just believe God that they're not going to, you know, overkill with too much money and we're overtaxed. So just believe God to, to help them, amen, for guidance and wisdom. You pray for our, our president, uh, Joe Biden, um, and you pray for his administration and God's hand of grace. And let's just pray for our, for our generation, this young generation. Let's pray that God would move and pour out his spirit I want to kind of talk about that tonight. So let's just believe God. You pray with me. And then, Brother Heath, you open us in prayer. Father, we approach your throne. God, hide us behind the cross. The blood of Jesus sets us free. And, God, we come and petition you, Father, with our needs and desperation for salvation. Family members, neighborhoods, God, all the peninsula. Father, we pray for revival and outpouring of the Holy Ghost. Physical well-being for our nation, God, our leaders in our church. A building, God. We just pray, establish your purpose. Brother Ephi, if you would just open us. Thank you, Father God. Tonight, Father God, as we ready to hear your word, Father God, and ask, Father God, run with that endurance, Father God, with this life, Father God. Let us, there's a prize waiting for us, Father God. Put that in our heart, Father God. Father, we pray for all that's going around in the world, Father God. We pray your Holy Spirit, this last days of revival, Father God. Stir our heart, Father God. Put that fire in our heart, Father God. Amen. Why don't you worship with me? You raise your voice. Lord, we thank you. Amen. Uh, we are a Pentecostal church, so we believe in the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You don't have to speak in tongues to come to our church, but we do uh, contend. Uh, that you apply that ap that aspect of biblical principle that um, contends for baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Let's, I, I also wanted to mention, pray for um, the schools as they're opening. Uh, second and third graders are going to be going back. Or to, you know, and so they're slowly opening them up. So pray that you know the families and, and all the people involved, bus drivers and the teachers and everybody um, that people would stay healthy, amen, as we're, we're, we have very uh, strict protocols, and so let's just pray hand uh, God's grace upon all the, the administration and the leaders that are making the decisions, you know, and then pray for the teachers and the parents and the students as well. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 19 and 22, what don't you want? How many of you, 
you stop by McDonald's or you go by Taco Bell or uh, um, uh, oh, not King's Walk, but uh, the uh, noodle place. No, uh, right there on um, on uh, Chung's. You go by Chung's and get chicken teriyaki or wherever it is that you like to go and you get food and you can smell it in the bag. And, no, 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 don't get anything. Don't eat the french fries. Just wait till we get home. And you eat. Right? And what, what you know, or if you're there, we, we can't sit down and order. But, you know, usually when you're ordering a hamburger, you're somewhere, you know, and they'll tell you, you want everything on it. I'll take everything. You know, if it's me, nah, hold on, hold on, uh-uh. I don't want tomatoes, I don't want onions, I don't want garlic, I don't want cilantro, I don't want nothing. Just give me mustard, pickles, cheese, and a bun. You know, just simple. You know, I don't want all that other stuff to, to get in the way. I came across this article. Uh, so this man, him and his wife, they, they, they order their cheeseburgers, and, you know, he's excited. The wife does it through Uber Eats, and they show up. And they open up the thing, and, and he's like, "Huh, oh, my hamburger's in a pancake box. Okay, I guess my wife ordered me the works. I don't know. And the wife gets her meal. Oh, mom, hallelujah. She starts eating. And nothing's worse than getting food delivered to your house, the article says. And you're ready to eat only to find out that your meal was a mistake. It's a devastating feeling. And the man doesn't have McDonald's to blame. He has his wife to blame. His order went very wrong. Instead of the double quarter pounder burger he hoped for, with no pickles and no mustard, what he was left with was just a mush of ingredients. His wife, as she was ordering, pushed the wrong buttons as she was there, ordering digitally from her phone. And instead of selecting pickles and mustard, she accidentally clicked the option for no patty and no bun, right? So when he opened it up, all he got was pickles, <laughs> slices of cheese, some onions, and some ketchup, you know? And he was like, what is this? And then he realized, he can't call me, I'm gonna complain and tell him you get right? He ended up with a nothing burger. That was, that's not even a burger, it's like, that's not even a salad. That's just, you know, ketchup with some pickles and onions. In our text, Paul, Remember, Paul was the great evangelist. Paul gets radically saved, persecuting the church. The guy was filled with zeal for his religion, with passion, and gets radically touched by Jesus as he's going down the road of uh, 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 Damascus and gets thrown off his horse. You know, it is a picture of his high-mindedness and gets brought down, blinded, not able to see. They have to walk him into the city. Some little nobody... Ananias comes and lay hands on him and boom, scales and then prophesies over his life. And from that point on, man, Paul was set ablaze. 14 years, he sat off to the side, 10 to 14 years, you know, never really truly ministering. And then suddenly, boom, kicks it into gear and, you know, God begins to use his life. And so Paul here in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, he goes through and tells them, look, if I have to be a Jew, I'll be a Jew. If I have to be somebody who doesn't know the law while still maintaining the law of Christ to win somebody that doesn't know the law, I'll do that. If it's somebody that's under the law and zealous, I will do that. And so in our text, he says, For though I am free, read it with me, 1 Corinthians 9, 19, For though I am free from all, I've made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might have some. What don't you want? If God serves you up a nothing burger, convert, who doesn't seem to have a lot to offer, but let me tell you, in the long run, it's not what you are now, but what you can become. I mentioned uh, to the people here, in, uh, here um, about a couple, a gentleman that called me, from the El Paso church who I've known for 27 years. He walked into the church, you know, a stoner, not much ambition, but gets radically saved. And, you know, uh, working in the trades, electrician, 
slowly he finds himself, you know, he's married, he's been married 33 years. He was telling me both his older children are out of the house, married, his younger daughter, who has some uh, medical issues, uh, is there with her, they're, 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 they're caring for her, they have a business, him and his wife, they are very well-to-do, but they're very humble, simple people that provide for the church whenever they can, free services, very big givers, um, and are involved with people in the church. But I can tell you, when he probably walked into the church, he was a nothing burger. They opened up that pancake box and, huh? And there's not even a bun and hamburger patty in here. There's nothing but pickles and ketchup. See, what don't you want this evening? Do you want the perfect person? Do you want everything, you know, hey, I don't want to have to follow up on them too much. I don't want to have to deal with them. I don't want the headaches. I don't want the, you know, the drug addiction. I don't want the, you know, the issues with smoking. I don't want the issues of alcoholism. I don't want the broken background. I don't want any of that. I want them to come in, right, and just come from another church already saved and get in line with what we do. Well, that's not how Jesus works. Remember, they rebuked him. What are you doing with sinners? He said, I came here to what? Heal. I'm, a, I'm like a doctor. I'm looking for sick people. A doctor's not looking for wealth. He ain't going to get no money, obviously. But So Jesus said, look, I came here to find people that are sick. What don't you want? The heart to be all things. Let's look at that. What did Jesus mean when he said, do to others what you would expect to have done to you in Matthew chapter 7? You know that you and I have something to offer. The thing is, is we have to find opportunity to offer it up. To the weak I became weak that I might win the weak. The context of weak, meaning verse 19, I've made myself a servant to all to win more of them. Paul says, that whatever it is that I have, I'm going to offer it. You know, you can think, well, that person, man, they need they're probably a little higher than me in terms of what they make, the car that they drive, you know, the clothes that they wear. And you may think to yourself, well, I don't have anything to offer to them. But you never know that they may be brokenhearted, lonely, depressed, and a simple witness of faith to say, hey, you know what, you seem to have it all together when in reality they don't. Or we see somebody and we think to ourselves, well, man, you know, I'm better dressed, I'm not as crazy. Cars a little better. Those people, man, I'm, heck no, man. I bring them to church and then they find out where I live and they take my stuff. See, that's what Paul is saying, that I might win the weak, meaning we all have something to offer. See, if you're going to do unto others as you would have done unto you, there's going to be certain things that you're not going to, certain prejudices that you're not going to allow yourself to see in those people. No matter their position, condition, disposition or opposition to the gospel, Paul says, I will be all things to all people. We may agree to disagree. Listen to me. We may agree to disagree on homosexuality, on transgenderism, on abortion, and a, an array of other issues, Democrat, Republican. But it doesn't mean we have to be disagreeable. My propensity in the gospel presentation to others, our propensity and presenting the gospel message should be with love and not hate for the sinner. For this is the essence of the law and the prophets. Do to others as you would expect to have done to you. Is what he's saying. This is the essence of the law and the prophets. Meaning, see people as yourself. If you're immediate to judge and have no grace, then guess what? How would, that's what you should expect in return. Loving the sinner who's ignorant of grace is what Jesus meant. Your Father in heaven gives good things to those who ask. Enter by the narrow gate. That's in the same context of when he says, do unto others. Meaning, your Father in heaven will give good things to those who ask. Right? Enter by the narrow gate. Meaning, hey, look, you have a choice. You have something to offer. Love the sinner who's ignorant in their grace. The best way to live for Jesus is to focus on what Jesus is focused on. Love your neighbor as yourself, Mark 12, 31 says. There is no other commandment greater than these. Love the Father with all your heart, your 
your soul, all your mind, all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. As a Christian, that's part of what we should be. If the Old Testament required an adulteress to be stoned, John 8, why didn't Jesus allow them to stone her? And why didn't Jesus get up? Because he wants to be all things to all people and stone her along with them. Listen, church, we must not give in to the climate of our time right now. The climate of hate and anger. And people, man, you know what? We can't even agree to disagree. See, the church, God is calling the church to the Ninevites. God is calling the church to go to the very people that seem to despise the Bible and everything that God stands for. And God says, draw your nets out and bring it in because that's where you're going to get revival. But Jonah rose to flee, John, uh, Jonah 1.3, from what Jesus was focused on, the Ninevites. He said, uh-uh, I'm going the opposite way. I don't run aimlessly, Paul says in, in our text further down first, uh, in chapter 9, verse 26. He says to the Jews in verse 20, I became a Jew that I might win the weak in context of what we're looking at through our text. You see, like the days of the prophets, the church is called to stand in the valley of decision and, declare, and to declare God's truth. Joel 3.14, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of, the de of decision. So you see Antifa marching through all these streets and BLM and these knuckleheads marching through the capital. Those very people in that moment that are angry and upset and in some cases just being fools and just jumping in with the boom. Those are the very people that are in the valley of decision because they all have to go home. They all have to go, and there's probably family members, somebody that's saved, somebody that's praying for them, that we may run into, and out of extension, God says, I want you to witness to that person. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. Jesus said, they hate me, they're going to hate you, John 15. So guess what? We don't have to respond in hate. 1 Corinthians 13 says that love never acts outside of itself. See, the time is coming where there will be a point of no return. And when that time comes, the church will be gone. But until then, we function in the climate of the times. And as the surroundings around us, listen, they sow, they will reap what they sow. But it does not mean that you and I have to get caught up in that. See, where are the prophets, the preachers of truth and righteousness that are willing to tolerate the harsh treatment from the very ones that God wants to reach? I have become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I might share with them in its blessings. Paul says the very people that I persecuted are the ones that I want to see saved. The very people that are persecuting me, the Jews, those are the very people that I reach out to. See, the church is called to confront and influence the world. Believing personally, declaring spiritually, and teaching culturally. You see, love is more than a word. Jesus didn't love people only to leave them in their sin. He embraced the sinner in order to heal and forgive their sin. To those outside the law, Paul says, I became as an outsider of the law. Not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ. Listen, I affirm the sinner in their state, but I don't affirm the sin. I embrace the sinner, but I don't embrace the sin so as to burn myself. So he's telling them that I might win those outside the law. All of us are surrounded by people at work, school, in our homes, in our extra activities, ex, you know, curricular activities, right? All of us are surrounded by sinners who need Jesus. Why do you eat, Luke 5, 30, with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered, those who are well have no need of, of a physician, but those who are sick I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. I will be all things to all people. 
See, there was a man who goes to McDonald's, right? Uh, I'm not picking on McDonald's because you work at McDonald's, okay? It just happened that these are the stories that kind of went with my sermon. So he goes to McDonald's, and he comes home with his order. And man, this isn't what I ordered, you know? And kind of doesn't go back to the store. And before you know it, they knock on his door, and it's the cops. And they said, you know, you should have taken the order back. Man, I spent $20. And the cops are sitting in there, and the guy's like, no, 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 you don't understand. They gave me the wrong thing. And the cop says, uh-uh. You only ordered two frozen uh, drinks, but you took home two bags of food. They said, man, you stole that stuff. And he's like, wait a minute. No, 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 you don't understand. And they, were, it's like, no, they said he even filmed to make it look like he got the wrong order, and then he took the food. He intimidated the people and then left, and they said, wait a minute, bro. It's not that you got the wrong order. You took the wrong order, and you took it home and ate it. <laughs> See, how do you be all things to all people? You don't want to steal a meal, right, and then try to say no, right? You use what you got, and you accept people for what they are, and you allow God's grace to work in the both of you. Amen? This is what I loved about Pastor Mitchell. You know, in the years that I've served God, Pastor Mitchell told so many funny stories about the hippies coming. You know, Pastor Mitchell grew up in the 40s and 50s, you know, the baby boomer generation. And, you know, he was a different kind of cat, you know, the way, you know, he, you know. And so when he see all these hippies, long hair and, you know, and coming in and getting stoned and free sex and, Dogs in the church and, all, you know, Pastor Mitchell just said, hey, all these people that were hippies coming are now leaders throughout our fellowship. And I've had a few encounters with Pastor Mitchell where just his grace and mercy towards sinners made you realize this guy is all things to all people. I see a crooked person. But he knew their thoughts and he said to the man with the withered hand, Come and stand here. And he arose and stood there. So Jesus was going to heal on the Sabbath. And the religious leaders knew it. And they had this level of anger. He better not heal on the Sabbath. Why is Jesus asking for you and me to come? Why does he call the sinner, come and stand here? The answer is, sin is simple. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you. See, Jesus is into transforming people and not simply telling people about the possibility. 1 John 4, 12, no one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. See, Jesus wants, uh, Jesus, what Jesus wants is what he wants to perfect in us. That is a love for people. That word perfected means to fulfill, to finish, to consecrate. Meaning Jesus says, I want you to be motivated, not for a big building, not to have an exciting ministry. I want you to be motivated to see people saved. And in the process of you loving people and them being unloving, I'll work in both of you. In the process of you being unloving and not wanting to love people, but bringing, God brings the people in, I'll work in the both of you. See, people love being right. But Jesus is not into self-righteousness. Because of sin, opposition, or whatever, church folks refuse to go to Nineveh. I see crooked people. I ain't going to work on that withered hand, that withered heart, that withered mind. Jonah was displeased. Remember, he was angry. He goes, I knew it. This is why I refused to come. Because they were going to repent. Jesus wants us to change our mindset and realize that he sees beyond the crooked people. He sees the canvas of hope. Do you do well to be angry? Though I am free from all, I've made myself a servant of all, to the weak, all things, to all people, to win more of them. You see, Jesus wants us to see beyond, wants us to see beyond the crooked people and to believe that they can become something else. Now, we don't got to be stealing things. We don't got to be stealing people from other churches. What we want to contend for is the broken people, 
the lost, the people that have no clue about Jesus, have no ability to serve God or even think rightly. God can move in the power of the Holy Ghost to transform people and give them an, ab an ambition with a gospel principle. Luke 13, 11. Woman, you are set free from this crippling evil spirit that has had you bent, doubled over, and unable to stand up straight for these 18 years. She had a physical condition that prevented her from functioning. How many people do you know have a physical condition that prevents them from functioning? I grew up around dysfunctional people. I myself was one of those dysfunctional people. I grew up in a home where my mother was a working alcoholic, drunk on the weekends, and didn't, was never late to work during the weekdays. Woman, you are set free from the crippling evil spirit. Do you see the opposition? Working to destroy and to hinder what God wants to do as God brings these people in. You see, Jesus reworks the crooked people. And he wants us to see people the same way. Man, God can do something amazing. See, not like Jonah and the leaders in the synagogue who were indignant because Jesus was going to heal on the Sabbath. See, compassion for people is a form of faith. Compassion for people is a form of faith. When people see you coming over here and just try to help them, just because, people know that it's not real. But when you come with compassion and empathy, man, they, you know what? Something in you flows through and they say, man, they got faith for me. I can believe. I can do this. See, and this is something that you have to learn through experience in working with people and helping people. Because sometimes you're going to get burned. Sometimes the Ninevites, guess what? They're going to take your Happy Meal, man. And you're like, well, what? All I got here is no bun, no burger, right? I just got a bun, nothing burger. See, but I want to tell you something. People want real love, real joy, real peace, a hope to where they can live happily and not be overcome by hurt. They want to be loved for who they are. And sometimes... We have to allow the sinner to be a sinner in order for them to understand the power of grace. To the weak I became weak that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. See, we don't have to participate with the sin. But you have to love the sinner before they're delivered from it. Well, I can't love you and have you over until you're clean. How many of you, it don't work like that. You know, we're going to sit outside with a spiritual water hose. Okay, man, you can come in. A blind man began to yell out when he heard Jesus was nearby. The people in front of him told him to shut up. And he cried even louder, Jesus, have mercy on me. The Bible says that Jesus stopped. There's a lot of other people. You know, you know right? Superstar, you gotta get your autograph, man. Take a selfie, you know. But Jesus heard somebody who had a need. He heard this man crying out amongst the crowd. Hey, wait a minute. There's somebody here. Jesus stopped and commanded the people around him bring him close to me. I can rework that crooked person. I can rework that crooked son that crooked daughter, that crooked person. Your faith has made you well. See, what did Jesus hear? Faith. And it connected with what? His compassion. So you see that? Compassion is a form of faith. See, so right here as we close, listen to me. How do you be all things? How do you get a heart to be all things? What don't you want? I'm going to tell you. Is it anger and scorn and indifference for the sinner? Mm -hmm. What don't you want? Oh, I'll take that. Yeah, go ahead and put that on my burger. Yeah? No, man, put an extra dose of anger on there, please. Uh, no, 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 no. Hey, man, what are you doing with that scorn? Put that back in there. See, we are called to love and have victory. 
through people. It involves a commitment and a connection to a cause. Faith and compassion. Motive while you love a person in their sin. Rather than having anger and scorn and rebuke for the sinner, as Paul quotes Jesus in Acts chapter 20, uh, Jesus himself, he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And I know that's a difficult passage because we can't find it in the Gospels. And how do we know? Well, the Bible says that there were multiple things that Jesus did that, we did that were not able to be written down. And so this is something that was passed around. Jesus himself said it is more blessed to give than to receive. And so here's Paul writing to the Corinthian church, working with the Corinthian church. Remember, the Corinthian church was jacked up. People were using the gifts and speaking in tongues all crazy. And he had to rebuke them. A father, uh, a son had his father's wife. All the sexual immorality, the idolatry, and the things that were going on. And Paul tells them, For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all. That I might win more of them. To the weak I became weak. That I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people. That by all means I might save some. some. See the human personality hungers. It thirsts. And it longs for acceptance. Which is love. It longs for security. Joy. Recognition which is peace. Somebody recognizes me and that validates their existence. See, sometimes we have to embrace the sinner in their sin to affirm their humanity. See, we help give them an opportunity to accept their sin and repent or convert. See, affirming their humanity without affirming their sin. Hey, we accept you. Why would I not? Why would I want ill will upon you. That's not the whole gospel principle. This isn't supposed to be hell and I'm not supposed to bring judgment in that sense. That's at the end. If you don't want to judge your sin now, then you're going to have to judge it later. And like I've been touching on, then you're going to end up like the rich man in Lazarus when it's too late. We help them with an opportunity to see their sin and their sinfulness that God can have access. Remember, was we are ambassadors 2 Corinthians 5, as though God himself were speaking through us, be reconciled to me. See, if we're not careful, church, we may make for ourselves belief systems of comfort. Oh, I remember somebody told me, oh, I see. Is that the kind of people you want to reach out to? I thought, what kind of people is that? Sinners? I mean, there's sinners in every rank, you know, if you will, of economic, you know, positioning and intellectual understanding and education. What, what, what are we saying? Is it just because we outreach in the hood or apartments or whatever? Because we're not going to, to uh, uh, um, we're not going out into the island or we're not going to Paul's Bowl, you know, what are we talking about here? See, why do we want to play church and create these belief systems of comfort that oppose the power of becoming? It's not what you are now, but what you can become. Why do we want to play church when Jesus is here to command healing and deliver the people of Nineveh saved and he puts them right in our churches? See, the gospel message is revolutionary. To the rich person who's dependent upon their position, God can set them free and bring a level of modesty and utilize their position and influence for the gospel while still continuing their blessing. Remember, Paul says, I will participate in their blessing, no matter who they are, whatever rank, what, I'll be all things to all people. See, what makes the gospel revolutionary is that it's, that it's a call for people to experience the kingdom of God here and now. So the person that's calling and the person that comes in, guess what? We share in the blessing of salvation. Just like when I was called and I came in, man, I'm so glad that I'm saved and I was embraced by the people of faith. And together, we were blessed in salvation by whatever differences there were, whatever prejudices there were, until we learned, hey, man, you're a lot similar to me. Yeah, man, we're the same. See, what don't you want? What you don't want is anger and scorn and indifference for the sinner. So right here, 
Let me give you three things. One, believe personally to have a heart to be all things. Do you not know that in a race, this is verse 24 of, of uh, 1 Corinthians 9, do you not know that in a race all the runners run? So this is a picture of every person in humanity. We're just running. We're living life. But only one receives the prize. So run that you may obtain it. I remember, he's talking about a prize, salvation. Run with meaning. As everybody's going along, God is going to pick somebody out for you to run with and get them along, right? The narrow road. Meaning faith sees beyond the crooked person. Nine, verse 19 of our text, Though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win more of them. Not all of them. He says, at least more of them. Believing personally to have a heart to be all things. Two, declare spiritually and become all things to all people. Verse 25, he says, every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath. So he's talking about the athletic games that the Romans would go through. He goes, but we an imperishable one. He goes, so we're running a race with everybody. And we just so happen to be Christians in the race. They're running to get a perishable wreath. Ooh, I went. It's going to boom. It's going to go away. Tom Brady or uh, um, uh, Mahomes. Uh, what does it matter? They get a ring. Yeah, they ain't taking it with them. But what about seeing people saved? He says, we will receive an imperishable one. Therefore, have self-control, discipline. Meaning, love calls people to accept their sin and repent. Declare spiritually and become all things to all people. He says, to the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. We call them to their sin. Meaning, we embrace the sinner. While in their sin, we affirm their humanity, but we don't affirm their sin. Teach culturally last that obedience is better than sacrifice or compromise. Do not run aimlessly. We're running a race and we're trying to get to the prize, right? And all of a sudden you're running. <laughs> Where's he going, man? What? Is, is, is that another place that I have to go to? Do not run aimlessly. Do not box as one beating the air. Meaning, fight the right fight. Discipline your body and keep it under control. Meaning, obedience is better than compromise. What don't you want? Well, I don't want scorn and anger and indifference. But what I do want is love, faith, and obedience for the sinner. He says, I have become all things to all people, that by all means, I might save some. You know, when we were walking, as I talked about Sunday, the wind and the whirlwind, and we were coming down that hill, and you know, and if you remember, I was made that little joke, you know, it was, you know I, don't, I think it was five or six little skinny Mexicans just, you know, don't, don't blow us away, you know, and, and we go down this, at the time, you know, that hill just seemed like, man, Mount Everest. We walked across that desert, you know, and it wasn't, I mean, it was probably from here to the parking, the, from here to the end of the parking lot. But when we were kids, man, it felt like, you know, the desert in Egypt, man, the Sahara, like, man, it would take for days for us to get across. Little did we know, as we're walking across, stumbling and crying, there was a lady in her kitchen, a mother who was looking outside and she saw us. Her backyard was literally facing this, this ravine and the, and the desert, and she could see us coming. And so here we are because this desert, the school was over here, and then there was this desert. Uh, up here was a Kmart. And when you got across, there was a whole community. They just decided they couldn't build right here because it was the reservoir. And so and there was another community down here. So we came down from the school, and this lady was the, first, the last house or the first house right in that community, and she could see us. And in the midst of the whirlwind, and the, she goes out and rescues us, brings us in, gives us cookies and milk, cleans us up, calls the police, and they took each of us home. They dropped us off. I remember when I got dropped off, my brother was sitting there waiting for my mom, and he didn't have a key. And he sees me get out of the cop car, and he was like, 
What do you mean? You know, my brother was like, I was like seven, eight, and my brother was like probably 13. You know, what are you doing getting out of a cop car? You know, I said, oh, and I told him the whole story. That's who we are. We're the ones looking and we see the sin. They have no clue. A sinner has no clue what they, man, I'm living. I mean, there's a way that seems right to a person. Hey, I'm, I'm living. I'm running. I'm aimlessly. I'm going there. And Paul's saying, we don't need to do that. Run under control. Discipline. And then God, you see that person over there? They're crying out to me. See, because the person may be at work, at school, wherever, and boom, outside. And, oh, man, I don't need no God. You know, they walk around. But inside, in their homes, they're crying out. And God's like, man, be under control. Be ready. Be all things to all people, to the weak, to the <laughs> Jew, boom, to the law, to those out of the law. Boom, right there. Boom, and boom. Hey, man, what's up? And then, bam, all of a sudden, God says, that's the one. Bring him in. Believe personally to have a heart to be all things. Declare spiritually and become all things to all people. Teach culturally that obedience is better than compromise. Faith sees beyond the crooked person. Love calls people to accept their sin and repent. What you don't want is not scorn, anger, and indifference for the sinner, but love, faith, and obedience for the sinner. See, because compassion is a form of faith. Let's bow our heads. See, God's going to bring revival. He's going to bring in all manner of sin. People broken, confused, unsure. People that need leadership. Women that know how to be mothers. Teach young women how to be daughters. How to be young women. Men who need father figures to help them and to lead them. Women who need father figures to be a covering and to bring security. Men who need uh, mother figures who have a level of compassion. This all functions within the church. Brothers and sisters in Christ that love one another and that we learn to walk in that love together. And we see the sinner affirm their humanity and call them to repentance. If you're here and you don't know Jesus, if you're listening and you've never made a decision for Christ, today is your day for salvation. If you're there listening, here listening, and you're backslidden, distant from the kingdom, blocking off your spiritual ears from the conviction of the Holy Ghost and say, no, 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 I want to do my own thing. God's calling you back, backslider. Tonight you can say a simple prayer with me. One of confession where you recognize your sin and you repent. As I personally believe, and God wants to touch a crooked person tonight. And I declare spiritually, I call people to accept their sin and repent. I call you to do this thing the same. And so tonight you can repeat after me. You can confess with me and say this prayer. Anybody who's never received Jesus or you're backslidden, just repeat after me. Jesus, I believe. You died on the cross for my sins and you rose from the dead. In dying, I am forgiven. In rising from the dead, I am empowered by your spirit to serve you. Oh, Lord, help me to have faith and to cry out more and more to you daily. God and the church people together will bring me closer to you. In the wonderful name of Jesus, amen. You pray, church, I challenge you. Maybe God's dealing with you and telling you, don't have an indifference and a scorn and an anger like Jonah and the religious people and the people that were in front of that man. Shut up. Be all things to all people, affirming humanity but not affirming their sin. Jesus is calling you to rework your heart so you can help him rework others. You take this opportunity to pray and we'll close. Father, I just pray your anointing, your grace and empowerment. Lord, we don't got to steal the Happy Meal. We don't got to sit there, God, and worry about whether or not the meal is complete or full, God. We can have a nothing burger, a crooked and broken convert, God, but you will take that. Heavenly Father, you take what we have to offer. And Lord, you can multiply it. 
you can satisfy. God, you are calling us to have a level of faith that is filled with compassion and empathy for the sinner. As we embrace the sinner in their sin to help them recover and repent and to begin to work through the process of becoming God. Learning to be enabled and equipped and empowered. Learning to walk forgiven and delivered. Learning to be built up in dignity. To be restored to a level of wholeness. To begin to pursue your destiny. Church, you begin to pray and cry out. There in your homes, your living room, you begin to say, God, help me. To have a level of compassion beyond my ability now. To love the sinner. God, to love the person that I may have a prejudice towards, God. Because of the way they look or what they have or don't have. What I think of as being less than me. Or, God, I just pray your hand of mercy and grace. Hallelujah, Jesus, you are worthy to be praised. Glorified and magnified, God, I pray a level of compassion, Lord. In these last days, Father, to embrace the sinner in their sin, to bring them to the crossroads of deliverance. Obedience is better than sacrifice and compromise. Oh, God, help us to declare spiritually, Heavenly Father, to teach culturally, and to believe personally, Heavenly Father. For the sinner bound in their sin, broken and crooked, withered, Heavenly Father, in their emotions, God. Cast down by their sin, judged, Heavenly Father. Help us to declare to them, I am here. I do not cast judgment. And I call you to repentance and the love of Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, help us to hear the cry as we're running the race of the person that in their heart, in their own closet, in the quietness of their room or their home, they're crying out, God, if you're real, Jesus, have mercy on me, Lord. Help us to hear that whimper, that voice, God. Let's love the sinner. Jesus did. And he died on the cross for us. And he rose from the dead. He pulled us out of the sea of scorn and anger and indifference. Remember as the disciples cast your net on the other side and they did. And I was a part of that. Brought me in and now I'm one of the fishermen. Amen. And sometimes we can be like Nineveh. Like Jonah that is. I'm going to get out of the boat, man. I'm, heck no, I'm going to go have a burger. I'm going to go watch the game. I'm going to go here. I'm not, not going to go to the Ninevites. Oh, God, I know, man. I gotta, I'm trying to put gas. I want to get home. I got to go witness that person. God, this person at work? No way. They're scoundrels. Oh, I'm not going to witness to them. I'm going to tell them about Jesus. I want to tell you, man, God's going to give you dreams. About people of your past, co-workers, people that you're working with now, somebody that you may not even know, and then you see them, and they're like, man, then God says, that's who I was talking about. I want you to tell them about me. See, we're living in the last days. Joel said, I'm going to give young people, maids and, and men, sir, I'm going to give them dreams and visions. Those dreams and visions aren't just simply about the end, you know, and, you know, YouTube prophecies. Amen? You know, it's about people. Saved. Somebody, tell, you know, hey, go tell them about me. Amen? What don't you want? You don't want scorn, indifference, and anger for the sinner. But instead, man, you want faith, love, obedience, a heart of compassion for the sinner. Father, I just thank you for this tremendous time of grace and mercy that we could participate with the power of the Holy Ghost to bring about conviction, sin, righteousness, and judgment. Heavenly Father, help us to reach out 
to the sinner, God, to be that opportunity for them to repent as you work through us to help them bring them to deliverance. In your wonderful name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Uh, we'll be back Sunday morning. Amen. I don't think no outreach this week. Amen. Yeah, no outreach this week. Yeah, we're outreach next week. So, next week. So keep all that in prayer. Remember, keep up with your your Bible reading plan. Uh, we're all the way back down in uh, the book of Isaiah. So you keep reading. Amen. God bless you. I love you.